go. So we're going to go for a, a couple of hours through a bunch of various different kinds of teachings, which means that we're not going to take a break. So just let you know that I'm not going to give you one, but if you have to take one, then by all means do that. But I'm going to cover just a few areas. <clears throat> In fact, I think I'm just going to cover four areas, and then I may cover one or two tomorrow night. That'll be different areas. So that's what we're going to do. All right, we're good? Yes. All right. These, uh, the, the teachings for these is not in the liberated book, it, but they're you get the small synopsis of them in the book. The prayers are all in the book. The teachings are on the, the two different flash drives I have. One is the audio that I did with Sid Roth, and, and then the other one, the long one that you probably you don't need unless you're in a different ministry that wants to train and equip people, because we're going to cover those things. Even the flash drive, we're going to cover most of those things, and I don't think you'll actually have access, so you don't necessarily need those things. <clears throat> I just have them out there in case you know somebody who does and you'd like someone to send it to them, okay? That's, that's, that's that. Well, let's talk about the, <clears throat> the power of the tongue. <clears throat> Life and death is in the power of the tongue, isn't it? That's, that should have been a yes. <laughs> you empower whatever you come into an agreement with. When we look in the book of uh, Genesis chapter 11, we see the Tower of Babel. It says this in verse 1. It says the whole earth had used the same language and the same words. That's significant. And then verse 6, the Lord said, Behold, they're one people. They all have the same language, and this is what they began to do. And now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. So understand, their agenda was not heaven's agenda. Their agenda was the agenda of man. It was the agenda of heaven. But God says this, if man comes together with the agenda of man and they come together in agreement and there's a unity, then it says nothing is impossible on the agenda of man. What do you think would ever happen if the church ever got on the same page? Come on. I mean, Paul would talk about this in 1 Corinthians and, you know, 110 and also Philippians 2, 2, about being on the same page. Jesus, I mean, that, the last prayer we have in John 17 is about becoming one, right? I mean, if we ever came into an agreement, became one, it would actually, it, the church would be absolutely unstoppable. Yeah. It's so significant. There's power. There's power in agreement. There's also power in words because words have substance and they have assignments. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 27, Isaac gives the blessing. Actually, he gives it to, to Jacob, but he's thinking he's giving it to Esau. Esau was, you know, was this old hairy dude, wolf man. Type. I mean, he was really hairy. I mean, you know, but Jacob had to put the skin on his arms. You know, that guy, that boy was, that boy was hairy, hairy. <laughs> but he, but, you know, he, he told Esau to go fix what, fix his stew and come back and give him the birthright, the blessing. And, and Jacob, you know, conspired with his mom and came there and did it before Esau could come back, fooled his father and. And then when Esau came back in, you know, he's, you know then Isaac realized, I, I blessed the wrong person. And Esau said, well, that's okay, Dad. Go ahead and bless me. He says, no, you don't understand. I gave it. When those words left him, they had substance and they had assignments. The book of James chapter 3 talks about the power of the tongue. It can set a whole forest on fire. It, it can curse. It's like a deadly poison. It sets the direction of your life because it's like a, a bit in a horse's mouth or a rudder that's on a ship. That's the power of words. 
in the book of Numbers chapter 22 and 23, people of Israel are going through the land that belonged to King Balak. And King Balak didn't like these people coming through his land. So what did he do? He hired, he hired a prophet to come curse them named Balaam. And on the way, Balaam had an encounter, or maybe should I say his donkey had an encounter, <laughs> which turned into a Balaam encounter. I mean, if your donkey starts talking to you, that would probably mess with you. It would with me. When he got up there, he could not curse the people of Israel. All he did was bless them because God would not allow his people to be cursed. <clears throat> That's the power of words. They have substance and they have assignments. And so since our adversary has been totally defeated, we talked about that this morning, since he's been utterly stripped of all of his, his authority, the only authority he has over us is what we give him. And if we can come into an agreement with this lie, something that he said, then if we come into an agreement, then we empower, we empower the assignment. A lot of times of those words to be fulfilled and give him permission to fulfill those words. See, the words of heaven are going to be different than the words of hell. The words of hell, you know, they both speak into our worth, our value, our destiny, our future, our significance. But hell will be like, you're good for nothing. You're worthless. Nobody likes you. You should have never been born. You're never going to find a spouse. The words of heaven will be like, you know, you're loved, you're important, you're significant. You are amazing. You're beautiful. But the words of hell are going to speak into the negativity. You're just no good. You should never have been born. You're, you're stupid, undesirable, things like that. And you see, what happens is that we become the product of the words that oftentimes people will speak over us that we come into an agreement with. I mean, if a parent tells their child they're stupid, even though they're not, I mean, they have the choice to receive those words or reject those words, but with somebody in authority has spoken that, they usually receive those words as truth, embrace that truth, and then, the, they're, then they get permission for that assignment to be fulfilled over in their life. <clears throat> Sometimes it's not the words that other people speak over, it's just the word that we speak over ourselves. Oftentimes not even realizing those thoughts that we have that we actually begin to speak over ourselves are not even our thoughts. They're put into our heads and we begin to say this stuff, I can't change, I can't ever win, I can't ever find victory, everything is hopeless. And they begin to just say these things over themselves, I can't ever make a decision, I can't. I mean, they just say it over and over again. Those words have an assignment and you give the enemy permission to fulfill those assignments when you begin to speak those things over you. <clears throat> We just product oftentimes of the words that we speak, both good or bad. I had a guy come in my church one time that we that we actually found him and restored him. He was he had walked away from the Lord, lost his family, couldn't keep a job, got back on drugs. Now he's getting his life back together and wants to start serving God. And then he comes to me one day and he says, I feel like I need to go back to the old church that I came from. I said, why do, you, why do you think that? He said, well, that old man, and I knew the old man. He said, that's my spiritual father. Led me to the Lord, discipled me. But he did have a kind of a strange doctrine, and I knew the old man, and I knew the strange doctrine, and it really was kind of weird. He said, but the more I began to grow and mature, I realized that this was not right, and I began to ask him and confront him. And every time I did, it, it, just, it just didn't go well. And I realized I really can't stay under this. So I, I approached him one day and I said, you know, I, I, you and I, are, we're not on the same page. And I don't think this is going to work. And I, I appreciate everything you've done for me. But, uh, you know, I, I, think, I think it's about time for me to, to step away. So I don't want to cause a scene. So I'm just going to step down from leadership and then slowly step out of the church. <clears throat> He says, the man got red in his face and yelled at him and said, God will never use you apart from this place. And now, you know, and of course, what happened to him is that he stepped out, he stepped out of the church, but since God can't use him, he stepped away from God, lost his family, 
lost, couldn't keep a job, got back on drugs, and then went, now he's getting restored, and now he wants to serve God, and all he can hear are those words. You see, sometimes even spiritual leaders can curse the sheep. The Bible speaks to all the different ways that we would use our tongue in a negative way. You know, it, it addresses, you know, uh, criticizing, complaining, judging. I mean, complaining is just nothing more than, than the worship language of hell. I mean, it caused the people of Israel to not come into their land of promise. I had a friend of mine named Susan Starr who was, who was healed. Uh, and she's going to begin to really just point out how, how complaining shuts down the thing of God. Because <clears throat> Susan Starr was, was healed of dysautonomia. And that's when your, your autonomic nervous system, the thing that regulates everything in your life, you know, your heart rate, your temperature, all that stuff, uh, your breathing. I mean, it, it just, it's, it doesn't work. It's, it quits working. It's fatal. You will die from it. And so she had gone into the septic shock about eight years earlier. And then she, you know, blew up to like two-thirds of her colon, so that was gone. And kicked in dysautonomia, so for about eight years she was just going down the tubes she got she 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 got a word from the Lord actually when when she was in the hospital she was in in the hospital in September of two thousand and nine and she had MRSA she already lost her short term memory so she's writing everything down so it's, it comes to her mind so in the middle in, the, in it's it common she just have her lists and so she since she forgot everything she just had her list and she she wrote her, Randy Clark's name down in the middle of the night five times. So. And didn't know who he was. Thought he was a doctor she was supposed to see. But then found out that he's a guy that really has a healing ministry. <clears throat> so she goes to see him. <gasps> and he, of course, wasn't there. And, and uh, <laughs> works through a kind of a restoring the foundations thing. But she looks at his calendar. He's going to be where she lives in North Carolina. In High Point, North Carolina, she lived in Greensboro. Like, he's going to be there in April. You know, is she, like, if I can live till then, maybe I'll get healed. And she made it. And so we had a conference going there. I was teaching. Randy's teaching. John Arnott was teaching. And, and uh, so she came there. Her friends sit her on a little thing on the floor there. You know, she made it 90 minutes the first day. That's all she can do. And uh, went home. Uh, next day, you know, she had like diarrhea like 17 times a day. And on the way over, explosive diarrhea, had to go home, wasn't going to come. Her friend said, you get over here today is the day of your healing. So she, okay, cleaned herself up. So she's there late. And in the first session I taught, and then Randy's teaching, she comes in and she's not going to last long. And somebody asked me, hey, can you pray for her? And she's not going to last till tonight, which is a healing service. So I said, sure, I'll pray for her. So we gathered in the little fellowship hall area, and I started to pray for her as the Lord showed me how to pray. And it, in just a few minutes, you know, keep understand, understanding, she's dying. Hospice has already been called in. They'd given away her winter clothes. She wasn't expected to live more than three to four weeks. And in just a few minutes, she was instantly, completely healed. She said it felt like golden hot chocolate came on her and uh, flowed in her, flowed over her. And, and so, I mean, now she's just instantly healed. I mean, she's feeling really good. She goes to the partner's lunch, eats everything she's not supposed to eat. She gives her testimony at the, at the end of the week like, you know, I went three days without a bowel movement. I mean, for her, that was like a miracle. And, and, but one thing that happened to her, she, all of a sudden this anointing for healing comes on her. She gets stuffed. I mean, she comes from a cessationist background. She's, she's not familiar with anything or the craziness of anything of the spirit. And, you know, I mean, she's, and things are happening to her like, like gold dust. It's all just all on her. It's all like her clothes. It's everywhere. It's in the yard. UPS comes in like, what's this gold stuff in the yard? You know, and everywhere she goes, it's all over her. her she says, I don't know. And her daughter would call her Tinkerbell because it would just kind of, I mean, she, it was pretty, it's pretty bizarre. It, and uh, 
So she comes and she, I, we had an intensive, and so she comes to get some training in intensive. She goes, I want to, I want to go, I, I, you know, because you realize she, there's a healing anointing on her, and, and there's a whole lot more to this story. I'm just giving you the top of it. Because everybody she starts to pray for gets healed. So I told her, well, you need to go to Brazil with Randy Clark. So that fall, that's where she went. First guy she prayed for was a boy with club feet, and we're talking the foot is completely, you know, over. He brought tennis shoes because he thought I might be healed. And he used them because he was healed. That foot turned, prayed for another boy who had brain tumors. Those are all left. Went to a lady's house and prayed for her, and she had tumors all over her body. She was an older woman. They thought she was going to die. The family was gathered because they thought this is her last and within about an hour after she left, all those tumors faded away. She got up and helped fix family, food for the family, stuff like that. But what would happen to her is that her hands got hot, so hot, like she needed to put, you know, she liked drinking iced tea. So she's always putting her hands getting on iced tea. It just that's how she did it. And, you know, and, and she said, but I found out one thing. She said, if I get around complaining, it cools. The anointing gets shut down when she gets around complaining. She's having her very first Thanksgiving with her family. It's her thing. She, her winter clothes were given away, so she had to buy new stuff. And everybody's coming up to her house for Thanksgiving because she's thankful. I'm alive. I'm not dead. She's fixing Thanksgiving lunch. Then all the people in her family who come over who need healing, her hands get so hot. I can't finish Thanksgiving dinner. But she had a nephew who's the most negative person in the world, so she pulled him in to the kitchen. She says, how's life? <laughs> she said, my hands cooled down. I was able to finish dinner. <laughs> That's what complaining does. Wow. It shuts down the anointing. Wow. See, with our words, we either empower angels or we empower demons. Yeah. Matthew 12, this is an interesting verse. Matthew 12, 36 and 37, it says, And I say to you, Jesus is talking here, Every careless word that men shall speak, they shall render account for it on the day of judgment. For by your words you shall... Every careless word, that means everything... That you shall be condemned. So in every careless word, that means everything that comes out of us, we're going to revisit that because words have substance and they have assignments. <clears throat> My dad was a guy who's he was a pastor, but he always went to places that were in Christ. His leaders together and say pray on Sunday morning. They began to cancel every word spoken against them, against the church, against him as a pastor. They cancel every assignment of those words. He says that began to shift the atmosphere over the house. Luke chapter 6, this is an interesting passage. <clears throat> and I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. <clears throat> Then verse 35, love your enemies, do good, expect nothing in return, and your reward will be great. You'll be the sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. By the way, let me just say this. You cannot even obey these verses if you don't have enemies. You should thank God you have enemies. Thank God, I can, at least, I can obey the scripture now. <clears throat> oh, okay, that's a sad note. <laughs> be merciful as your father is merciful. Do not judge and you'll not be judged. Do not condemn and you'll not be condemned. Pardon and you'll be pardoned. Then verse 38. Now, we often hear verse 38 in the context of the offering being passed. It does, it, it, you can't apply it to offering because it is a spiritual principle here, but the context happens to be of judging. <clears throat> Give, 
and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, pouring into your lap. For by your standard of measure, it'll be measured back to you in return. Give, and it shall be given unto you. So in other words, whatever is coming out of you is coming back to you. And when it comes back to you, it's coming back to you in a greater way than when it left you. So if you got negativity, judgment, cursing, all that stuff coming out of you, those words have substance and assignments. Guess what's coming back to you? Because they have substance and assignments, therefore, when it's coming back to you, it's coming back to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. I mean, it's coming back to you in a greater way. I mean, when somebody says to me, you know, I feel like everybody's judging me. I go, well, who have you been judging? But when blessings coming out of you, What's coming back to you? Blessings coming back to you, good measure, pressed down, shaking together, running over, pouring into your lap. I mean, it, you just get to decide what kind of harvest you want. Somebody said, well, why should I bless my, my enemies? Well, only if you want to be blessed, because I think whenever you have opposition and you actually bless, I think it actually returns in a greater way. <clears throat> Okay, so Galatians chapter, ch chapter 3, verse 13 says this, that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. In other words, Jesus became my curse. He took all of that on the cross. So I don't have to live under, it, it's bought and paid for. So no matter what words... Other people have spoken against me. I can cancel them and break them. Any curse that I've spoken out against somebody else and coming back, I can, I can stop that. <clears throat> and I can cancel any curse that I've spoken over myself. I can break everything that I'm aware of and even things that I am unaware of. Does that sound good? Yes. Would you like to do that? Yes. Then why don't you stand up? <laughs> so we're just going, all of the things that we do, <clears throat> all of the things that we're going to do, uh, we're going to do it corporately, whether you need to or not. And this one, almost all we pretty much do. So we're, we're gonna, let's just do it. Let's break every curse that's come against you, okay? So repeat after me. Say, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus I, break I break every curse of words against me. I take every word captive, every word captive that's been spoken over me, that I spoke over myself, and I break the power of those curses from hell. I cancel every assignment of darkness, I cancel every of darkness and, I and I cast them to the ground and I, the ground. And I, call, a and I call a blessing to follow me in their place. To follow me in their place. I, take curse, I take back every curse that I've spoken against another, that I've spoken against another. and I cast those words down to the ground and I return a blessing on those with whom I have cursed. With whom I have cursed. Jesus, took my cursing, Jesus took my cursing so I can live in blessing. So I can live in blessing. Just let it just lift. Okay, just let it lift. <clears throat> let them fall off. You don't have to live under that anymore. Okay, you can be seated. What oftentimes happens
is that maybe in your next few days or quiet times or whatever, all of a sudden thoughts may come to your mind of words that other people spoke or that you spoke of yourself. And when they do, your first inclination is, oh, no, the devil's trying to do something to me. But it may not be the devil at all. It might be the Holy Spirit who's, who's basically speaking something specific that he wants you to take authority over. Let's talk about soul ties. This is not always necessarily something where there's demonic attachment, but sometimes it can lead to that, so that's why we cover it. I, I didn't know anything about really soul ties or that topic or anything like that. And, in, and then in the late 80s, I'm, I'm attending a retreat. Peter Lord, who's a pastor down in Florida at the time, basically did this teaching on, on breaking of soul ties. And my wife loved this so much that she couldn't wait to get back and share it with the other ladies in our church. <clears throat> so then I was at a, but you know, a week or two later, I'm sitting there, we're having breakfast, you know, with a bunch of the men that we'd gather, you know, a couple times a month, we had breakfast and a little sharing devotional stuff. And, and uh, one of the guys, uh, when everybody left, he wasn't leaving. So I know oh, something's going on here. Okay. So what's going on with you? He said, well, <clears throat> It was that Greek food, I know, causing me to cough. Okay, he said, well, my wife was talking to your wife. And she was talking to her about soul ties. So, you know, when I was in college, I had a relationship with a woman, and it was, it was sexual, and Anyway, my wife told me I need to talk to you. So he's not like this really excited person to take care of this issue. He's like the, a, he's reluctant. I said, okay, let's do this. Now here we're, we're, we're in Denny's, you know, so it's not like we're going <clears> to <throat> in a booth at Denny's. So I said, okay, well, just pray this prayer to me. Just repeat this thing. Say, you know, in the name of Jesus, I plead the blood of Jesus to stand between me and this woman. I call back everything I gave in this one flesh union, and I send back everything that I took in the one flesh union, declaring Jesus to stand in between. And when we finished that, he, he stopped and he goes, whoa, oh, I, I felt that. And of course, I said, you did? Like, you know, it, <laughs> like it actually worked. <clears throat> and so... I said, well, maybe there is something to this thing, you know? <laughs> so, you know, just taking from the notes that he gave us, you know, it, it's, it's like, you know, with God set things up. God has established his order, and we can't violate his order. And so we come to what he said or what, what God said, you know, with, through really through Adam in the book of Genesis uh, chapter 2, when man said, this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. You know, she shall be called woman because she's taken from man. And for this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, and they will become one flesh. And you have this thing repeated throughout the New Testament. You got to repeat it repeated in, in Mark 10, Ephesians 5, 31, uh, Matthew chapter 19. And if all we had were those passages, then we can think what he's talking about here is a man and a woman, you know, coming into covenant with each other. And you can think that if it weren't for the Apostle Paul who brought this up in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself with a harlot is one body with her, for it says the two will become one flesh. All right, so harlot. That's not a covenant relationship here. He's talking about sex. So in other words, there is a one flesh union through our sexual connection with another person. 
Two verses later, he says this in verse 18. He says, run away from sexual sin because no other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Run away. I mean, there's certain sins we, we, we resist. And some we run away. And this is a run away. <laughs> because God created some natural desires within us. See, we need to understand the way that, the way that God... The way that God set things up, he actually set things up in such a way that a man and a woman, as they come into a relationship with each other, that they, that they would, you know, enter into a covenant with each other. And through this covenant that they would enter into, they would consummate this covenant and join body, soul, and spirit. And then when they separated physically, they'd still be connected you know, right, really, there's, there is a soul connection that you have with your spouse. And so what happens, he created this activity that we engage in throughout our whole married life that actually keeps us connected to our spouse. There is a connection that, that happens in, 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 this, in this process there. And, and you see, God, what God does, God does not suspend his ways to accommodate our sin, so he just he's going to give you what he what he set it up for and what he set it up to do. So that's what happens, you know. And so this actually becomes a real blessing for those in the, in the marriage covenant with each other to 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 get the freedom to to engage in this activity throughout our married life, so that we would stay connected with with one another. And continue to knit ourselves to our spouses. And so it's a real blessing when, when it comes to, you know, those who are married, but for those, but outside of the marriage covenant, it becomes a real, a real curse for us. I mean, a really, a really negative curse. And usually, one of the things that happens is that because of this union, this knitting together, you actually begin to open yourselves up to what they carry. And, you, and one reason is because whenever you're engaging in, in, in illegal sexual activity, you're not spiritually protecting yourself. You don't say, well, before we do this, can we just have a word of prayer? <laughs> yeah. So because of that, then you may be opening yourself up to what that person is actually carrying. And you actually get slimed by that because that you've knitted yourself and your soul to that person. Now, usually when I get to this part, somebody goes, who's married to it like an unbeliever will go, oh no, oh no, I'm married to an unbeliever. I'm getting their cooties. <laughs> Well, I do got a good verse for you, you know, in 1 Corinthians 7, 14, that talks about that the unbelieving spouse is sanctified by the believing spouse. So in other words, you know, they're not, you're not getting their darkness. They're actually getting the, the light that you carry. So that's really the way that should work. Because, you know, in the new covenant, it's different than the old. In the old covenant, I didn't touch the leper or I get leprosy. In the new covenant, I touched the leper and they're healed. I carry the glory of the Lord. I carry the presence of God. I am the light of the world. Everywhere that I go into, I bring his light anywhere that I go. So it's like, oh, I find myself married to an unbeliever. You know, if I have a mindset that uh, I'm getting their junk, then that agreement with that will open you up to that stuff. But if you have a mind that set that goes, no, no, I got the glory of Jesus on me. I got the glory of heaven, then you actually bring that into the marriage and you actually even bring that to your spouse and open up an opportunity for them to come into the glory of God, into a relationship with him, okay? So don't freak out with that. Sometimes people enter into a one-sided bond because it's with fantasy, people like, you know, with pornography and stuff like this or people who are like, you know, stalkers. I mean, sometimes those, those people like that, they have a, they actually enter, there's, there's not an exchange of getting back and forth, but it's one-sided. But oftentimes with, even with this, the one-sided, I have them break that bond with the fantasy and take back what they've given, 
to that fantasy, that, that bond. There's other kinds of soul bonds that, that, that we could go into, but we're not going to because, you know, there's some things that we have friendships and relationships, some things that are healthy, some things that are not healthy. Uh, soul tithe can be, you know, in a, in a covenant relationship, in a friendship, you know, with, I mean, there's, there's some good things that can happen with that, but some negative things that can also happen with that. But we're just going to deal with this one particular area in the sexual area. And what we do, we, we, we come across a scripture that says this in the, in the book of Psalm 30, uh, 23, verse 3, in, in the, the Lord is my shepherd song, that he does restore my soul. We also find in 1 first, first Thessalonians 5, 23, it says, May the God of peace and self, himself sanctify you entirely, that your spirit, soul, and body be preserved complete at his coming. So in other words, there is permission to restore the soul. So let me just read this to you. It says, since restoration of the soul is the intention of the Lord, then there must be a way to bring restoration of the soul that has been fragmented in unholy, soulish relationships. Based on the intention of God for soul restoration and the dilemma of soul fragmentation by unholy sexual unions, we can deduce that God grants permission and authority to call our souls into holy alignment. We then confidently ask the Lord to restore our souls into wholeness. So we ask the Lord to restore what we have lost or what we've given away that rightfully now belongs to us. So we believe we can call them back in the order. So what we're going to do is that all together we're going to break a soul tie. Because I'm not going to say everybody who needs to stand, okay? <laughs> we're, we're just, we're just going to do that. Understand, whenever we break soul ties, it's one at a time. Okay? So, that's, so you'll just think about one person. If you don't need to think about anybody, you just kind of do it with the rest of us So because we're not going to, you know, embarrass anybody. And then you get together with God, you know, at another time. You just kind of take care of them one at a time. After he did this uh, at, on this retreat, we had a lady, I, we had the women's aglow that were meeting in our church, and I was on their board, and they had one lady who'd come out of prostitution. And, and uh, she taught on this topic, and she basically said this, the Lord had to go back to every John and break that soul tie. Either, and she go, God brought everyone back either by face or by name. She said, I'd given myself over so many times, I'd lost myself and lost my identity. And God restored it. Now, that is a rare thing. I've never seen anybody do that all, all, quite like that. And because a lot of the places I go minister to, it's people coming out of prostitution or in their brokenness. I tell them, just do the ones that God brings to your mind and the rest is the mercy of the Lord. Don't feel like you have to just give every name. You sit with the Holy Spirit. Do the ones he brings to your mind. If nothing comes to your mind, don't beat yourself up because you think, I know there's more. Just say, thank you for the mercy of God, and you just be at peace with that. Okay? So, so just, you know, you're going to do the one there. Uh, whenever we get to the part of, of uh, breaking the soul tie, we're going to say this person. Okay, do not say the name out loud, especially if you're next to your spouse. <laughs> okay, do not say the name uh, out loud. I say this, if you're, if you're divorced and there's no reconciliation possible, then you can, if you can, I, I think if your life has gone on, you've gone on, they've gone on, your lives are now separately, and there's no chance of reconciliation, I, I say, you know, go ahead and break the soul tie. But if there's a chance of reconciliation, if it's like you still want to stay connected with that person, don't break the soul tie with them. Okay? Just, just hang on to that. And be sure and hear the Lord with that. If your spouse is deceased... Uh, I don't think you have to because I'm looking at Romans chapter 7, you know, verse, those first few verses. When, it, In other words, when there's been a death, that covenant is, is basically done with. Uh, however, I was teaching this in Southern California, and a lady came up to me, an older lady. She said, when my husband passed, she said, I grieved and grieved and grieved, and I just couldn't get past it until I broke the soul tie. 
So I always say this, if your spouse is deceased, I don't think you have to. But if it's helpful, go ahead. So, are we good? Let's stand. And repeat after me. As you think about if, if you need to do this, what is one person that you need to break this soul tie with? Say, in the authority of Jesus, I plead the blood of Jesus to stand between me and this person and separate the one flesh union. I send back to them everything I've taken from them when I became one flesh with them. I call back to me everything that I gave in this one flesh union. I declare the blood of Jesus to be a wall of separation between us. Thank you, Jesus, for restoring my soul. Sometimes we don't feel anything, and sometimes we feel like a little bit of washing or a little bit of cleansing happening as things are kind of falling off of us. Okay, you can, you can be seated. One time I was, uh, I was teaching this in, uh, in, in England. And, uh, hang on a second, let me get this. I, w- I was teaching this in, in England, and a, a lady comes up to me afterwards. She goes, Oh no, I misunderstood. I broke the soul tie with my husband. (laughs) I said, that's okay, lady. You can go home tonight and fix that. Let's talk about forgiveness. <laughs> Most of us would be willing to forgive if we just actually knew what it was. Knowing what it is and what it's not. But forgiveness always begins by acknowledging that you have an offense. Because some people don't even want to not acknowledge that they've been offended. Because they feel like, well, you know, it, I'm just admitting that I'm just this unspiritual person. You know, they'll say, well, did, did that look like that hurt you? No, I'm okay. No, really, they, it, it looked like that really hurt you. No, really, I'm good. It's not bad to admit you've been offended because we're all human. We get offended. We, I mean, some of you just got offended just driving here today. You know? <laughs> the issue isn't that you're going to get offended. The issue is how quickly can you resolve the offense and move on? I don't know anybody who's just totally unoffendable. I've never met. Well, Bill Johnson, I think he's one of those. <laughs> I hang around him. I go, how do you even do that? You know? And, but it's, it's like how quickly can you resolve the, you know, the offense itself? Forgiveness is not saying it didn't happen or it didn't, it didn't happen to you. Some people think I'm just, you know, I'm like you want me just to obliterate this from my mind. Like you, you know, want me to act like it didn't even happen. You know, I mean, you don't have a delete button, you know. So just it's, it's not that 
you know, you're not saying that it, that it didn't happen. What you're doing, you're releasing the power of that event off of your life. It's not saying that you weren't impacted with it or, or it, you know, your life wasn't, you know, uh, changed with it. It's not saying that you've come to terms with it. It's not saying that, okay, you know, I'm okay with it now. I mean, you don't have to be, some things you don't ever have to be okay with. But your forgiveness releases the power of that event off of your life. When Jesus talked about it in, the, in the, the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 12, he uses some interesting terminology. He says, forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. So what happens is that if I sin against you and I offend you, I've created an obligation that needs to be paid. And you'd like me to pay that debt usually by suffering a little bit, because you think if I suffer, you'll feel compensated for that. But no matter how much I suffer, it really won't compensate you. You really won't feel paid back and compensated no matter how much I suffer or what I go through. It actually creates a loss that is actually unpayable. And one of the problems is, is that you actually stay attached to your offender until you choose to release them of what they owe you. So you have to just let it go. Forgiveness acknowledges that they owe you the debt, but you're making the decision to cancel it and release them from that obligation. That's what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is giving up any expectations. Whether they're realistic or unrealistic, it doesn't matter. You have expectations and they're not met. Over time, that can create some bitterness. You know, when, 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 when my wife and I got married, we, had, we talked about what we expected of each other. I expect this of you. You expect this of me. We had these expectations that we talked about. And if I don't meet those expectations that we talked about, well, that can create an offense on her part. Now, she will forgive me because she loves me, but over time, those expectations not being met can actually create bitterness inside of her. Sometimes we have expectations that we don't even know that we have until they're violated. If I, my wife has expectations that she didn't know she had, but I'm not meeting those, she gets mad and upset, and we start to talk about it. I says, well, I, we never talked about this. I mean, I didn't even know that you expected this. Of course, her, her response is, you should have known. <laughs> Sometimes we have expectations for our parents or for our children. And some of those expectations are legitimate. Let's say, for example, that, you know, growing up, I, I expect my parents to love me, take care of me, provide for me, protect me. But let's say that my parent couldn't do that. And so uh, now I got a decision. Am I going to hang on to that or am I going to release my parent to that? But the problem is, is that, you know, these are needs that I still have. And so what I do oftentimes, I've kind of put my life on hold because I'm waiting for one day that my crippled emotional parent would, would wake up, smell the coffee, come to me and say, I'm sorry. But what if they have no capacity to ever do that? Are you going to put your life on hold? That's not a good way to live. You see, you're going to have to release your parents of those expectations. And so I think you can actually come to God and, and as you release them to say, God, these are needs that I have that they didn't meet, but they're real genuine needs. And if, if they're not ever going to meet them, you're going to have to meet them. And I think you can actually put some demands on heaven to come meet those needs. And I think he will actually answer, the, answer that prayer. Forgiveness is not reconciliation. A lot of people think, I don't want to be, I, I, I'm not going to forgive because I don't have to be reconciled. But truth is, you know, reconciliation requires both people wanting to be reconciled. I mean, you know, it's like you can make the decision, I'm going to forgive and you're open to reconciliation, but you cannot control anybody else but you. 
It takes the other person to participate in. You cannot, you, you have no say in their life. You can't make them do anything, but you're still required to forgive even though reconciliation is not even possible. A guy comes to me one time and he says, well, I can't forgive my father. And I said, well, why can't you forgive your father? He says, well, because he's dead. I mean, because to him, it didn't count unless he actually said it to him in person that he had to actually say, I forgive you. He says, and he thought that's what it counted. And I says, no. I mean, you're doing it for, you know, you got to forgive regardless of where they're at. I mean, whether they're alive or they're, or they're dead or whether in another part of the world. I said, you, you don't have to be there to say it verbally for it to count. Now, having said that, let me just say that if the person offended you, does not know that they offended you, do not feel obligated to tell them. I, as, as a, when I pastor churches, I, you know, I pastored a long time, 32 years as a senior pastor and on staff other times. But I know that as, as a pastor, I happen to be the brunt of everybody's authority issue father issue, <laughs> parent issue, <laughs> all that stuff. I know that I'm brought So a lot of times when I get, when I offend somebody, it looks, a lot of times it's not me, it's their stuff. I just know it and I just take it, you know, because I know it, that's what it is. So somebody will come up to me and they'll go, Pastor, I just want you to know that I forgive you. <laughs> okay, like what did I do? <laughs> well... And they would tell me something, and then I would say, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know that I did that. Will you forgive me? Yes, Pastor, I will. <laughs> and 90% and of the time, it wasn't really anything on my part. It was their stuff, and their button got pushed, and it created an offense because they projected that stuff on me. Yeah. But what, what happens to me? Well, I mean, what's going in my head? I mean, on the outside, I got my nice pastor face. <laughs> but on the inside, I'm thinking, what is your problem? <laughs> my goodness, I can't believe that. What is your issue? So what happens is that their sharing with that creates an offense. And now I've got to go to God and take care of this one. And sometimes we want to say it to them because we're hoping to punish them a little bit. So I would say this, if somebody offends you and they don't know that they have offended you, you and God can take care of this. Do not feel obligated to tell them. If they are a repeat offender, yes, somebody needs to say something to them. But otherwise, you and God can take care of this one. Forgiveness is not releasing any kind of proper boundaries you would put around you to protect you from further abuse. Because some people are just not safe. Some people, you get near, they're going to explode on you. I mean, that created the fence in the first place. And so what happens, if you feel like, well, I got to say it to them, then you cross the boundary into their world and you say, I just want you to know I forgive you. And what you get is another explosion, right? <laughs> so now you got to go deal with that one. And then you come back and do it again. Like, quit, quit, stop it, okay? You can put... If you have an emotional boundary that keeps you from further abuse, you don't have to cross that boundary. You can actually, from this side, choose to forgive them. A lady comes to me one time. She says, my husband tells me I haven't forgiven him. I says, well, have you? She goes, I think I have. She said, you know, he had an affair, and I made the decision to bring him back or take him back. But every once in a while, when he gets close, it's... It, it just, there's some pain that rises up, and I says, you know, I just can't go there right now. And then he says to me, you haven't forgiven me. Because in his mind, he's thinking that if she forgave, then we go back to where we were before I had the affair. The problem is you can't go back there because you had an affair. When you did that, you violated trust. 
And trust has to be rebuilt. So he didn't want to do his part to rebuild trust. So he basically pulled the you haven't forgiven me card. So he was trying to avoid his part to rebuild trust. Now, my question to her is this. Are you allowing him to rebuild trust? Because if she's not, then he has a valid point. But trust has to be rebuilt. I can forgive you, but not trust you. You steal from me, I can forgive you for stealing, but I'm not going to let you have access to my wallet again. So trust has to be rebuilt. But you can still forgive even though, even though you don't trust. Forgiveness is releasing you to get on with your life. And it's kind of like Joseph in the Old Testament, whose, whose brother sold him into slavery. He goes into Potiphar's house. Potiphar ends up throwing him into prison. And now he's in like in the worst place you can be in prison. But then, of course, God intervenes, elevates him to the most prominent person in the land of Egypt under Pharaoh. And then when the famine in the land, your family comes, the very guys who put you in slavery show up. And a lot of us would have gone, hot dog. I mean, this <laughs> justice is coming to these guys. I mean, that's what in most of our hearts, but that wasn't in Joseph's heart. Because Joseph had forgiven his brothers for what they did, but they didn't believe him. They, they didn't know it. So they're going, okay, okay we're, he's going to kill us. I know he's going to kill us. I know he's going to. Why hasn't he killed us? I don't know. Oh, I know. It's dad. Dad's here. <clears throat> he's not going to do anything until dad dies. And then dad dies. They go, oh, no. Oh, no. He's going to kill us. So then Joseph calls his brothers together. And they're going, this is it. This is it. They're grabbing the grandkids. Oh, I love you. Just It's been great knowing you. You know, and they make their way into Joseph. And Joseph has this conversation with them. And he says this, guys, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. You see, when we have unforgiveness in our life, it becomes like constraints that tether us that we can only go so far in our destiny because we're tying ourselves to the things of the past. But when I choose to forgive, I'm cutting the things of the past and I'm able to be launched into my destiny. And that was Joseph. He was launched into his destiny because he didn't hang on to anything from the past. Do you have constraints that are keeping you from going forward? Do you have constraints that, that, innate, that simply keep you from moving to the fullness of your destiny? We've got to cut those constraints, and that's going to come through forgiveness. There are consequences when we don't forgive. We find one of those in Matthew chapter 18 where the, the servant owed his master, the king, so much money he could not repay it. It was unpayable, and it was, it was so huge, it's insurmountable. When the king called him, into, called him in and called him to account, he says, I can't do it. You know, would you have mercy on me? And the king showed him mercy and released him. Then he walks down and finds somebody who owes him a small amount, says, Where, give me the money you owe me. And he cries for mercy, and he doesn't show him mercy, chokes him, throws him into debtor's prison, which means he's got to stay there until family pays the debt. Not a smart move. Somebody told. King pulls him back and says, why did you do that? I mean, I forgave you this massive debt. You couldn't forgive this small amount. It says he threw him into the debtor's prison. And it goes on with another line, to be tormented by the tormentors. Who are the tormentors? I think they're demonic spirits. You see, the Bible says freely we have received, freely give. And if we have received God's forgiveness, we are obligated to forgive. It is no longer your decision or your choice. It is your obligation. Freely I receive, freely I give. God has forgiven me. I must. It is the demand of heaven. I must forgive. And if I do that, then I'm, I put myself in a place of grace. I position myself in the, in the empowering grace of God. But if I choose not to give, then I actually step outside of the grace of God, and I'm unprotected. The adversary is working on us so that we will not forgive, so we can it'll be in a place of unprotection so he can attack us. Because we have no protection 
because we've stepped out of grace, because we're not giving what we have received. Another thing that usually happens is that you're cursing yourself because when we talked about the power of words, what happens? What it comes out comes back to you. And if you, and, and if you have unforgiveness or bitterness in your life, what's coming out of you is not good things but negativity. And you stepped outside of the place of grace. Another thing that happens is physical problems. Here again, why? You stepped outside of grace. I have seen more people come into physical healing after they made a decision to forgive. I teached on this a few Sundays ago in, in Mexico. And just for fun, I just said, how many people are physically better Crowd of maybe 300, about 80 to 90 raised their hands, and, and 70 of them were 80% or better. A lady comes in my office one time. We had a, like a, I mentioned we had our day of prayers on Tuesday. She comes in on the day of prayer, and, and she's brand new, just coming to the church. I knew nothing about her history and her background, and, and uh, she says, okay, you know, I just, I had, you just got to know this, that, you know, I got this back problem. I've, I've I'm on social security disability because of my back. And I've taken everything legally that I can take. And I need you, you know, guys to pray for me. Could you do this? Oh, yeah, let's pray for you. And as we're starting to pray, the Holy Spirit speaks to me. And he says, ask her about her husband. I said, tell me about your husband. That man, you won't believe what he did. He left me and my kids. He never gave me any money. I mean, I had to raise those kids by myself. I had to provide for them. I had to work sometimes two jobs. But that was a long time ago, and I'm over it now. <laughs> Would you like for, to forgive him? No, I don't want to forgive him. He didn't deserve to be forgiven. You know, he ran off with that floozy, and they just went here and there, spent all the money they wanted to. He never gave me a dime. I had to raise those kids by myself. I had to work two jobs, sometimes three jobs. I got this back problem because of that. But that was a long time ago, and I'm over it now. When she forgave, God healed her back. I was in Brazil. One time with my wife, years ago with Randy Clark's group. And here we were, you know, if you've been there, we have a line. I had a line. My wife and I had a line of probably about 12 or 13 women. First lady comes up. Hi, can we pray for you? You know, we have a translator. She says, well, I got this pain in my back. I said, okay, we're starting to pray. The Lord speaks to me. Ask her if she needs to forgive somebody. Do you need to forgive somebody? Yes, there's this man. He hurt me. And when she forgave, she was healed. Next lady comes up. How can we pray for you? Well, she I got this pain in my back. Okay. Start to pray. Holy Spirit speaks to me. Ask her if she needs to forgive somebody. Do you need to forgive somebody? Yes, there's this man. He hurt me. And when she forgave, she was healed. Third lady comes up. This is a true story. Third lady comes up. How can I pray for you? She said, I have this pain in my back. I don't wait for the Holy Spirit. I said, is there somebody that you need to forgive? Yes, there's this man. He hurt me, and when she prayed, she was healed. The fourth lady comes up. How can we pray for you? She goes, I got this pain in my back. I said, well, what man hurt you? <laughs> no lie. Every one of those women had a pain in their back. Every one had a man that they needed to forgive, and when they forgave, they were healed. Sometimes bitterness will settle into the bones. Now, just because you have bone problem doesn't mean there's a bitterness issue, but a lot of times when I'm praying for people, I do, I do, I do check that out. But sometimes it doesn't matter how long ago the offense took place. I was doing this in Tucson one time, and a lady comes up. She goes, I just realized this. I mean, I've had a neck pain, a 20-year neck pain that was caused by an accident that I had 20 years ago, and I realized as you're teaching, I never forgave the person who ran into me. And when I forgave him, the 20-year neck pain left. And throughout the weekend, I kept checking in, and it was gone. 
Sometimes we have to forgive something that happened a long time ago. Forgive the person who ran into you. Maybe forgive the hospital, forgive the lawyers, forgive the insurance company. Maybe you might even need to forgive yourself for your participation in that. You cut off the impartation of blessing that others can come give to you. We're going to talk about generational things. Sometimes if we have offenses against parents, the enemy uses that to cut off generational blessings. I know this, that, that uh, whenever I, I, I pastored a church and somebody would come to me and they would say, Pastor, I feel like we're supposed to leave the church and I, we're going to go someplace else. And I said, would you just tell me why? If they said to me, you know, we're just not getting fed anymore. Then I would say, how did I hurt you? Because if they have an offense against me, they cannot receive from me anymore. Because you understand, I know it's not the preaching. It, well, I thought it was pretty good myself, you know. <laughs> but this is why people leave churches. They leave small groups. They leave communities. They leave because they have an offense that is unresolved, and they can no longer receive from those people anymore. And the thing that should get to you when nothing else is that your fender still has power over you until you forgive. Guy comes to my office one time. I didn't never met this guy before. He's about 35, young guy. Somebody recommended he comes in. I said, "What's going on?" He said, "My life's a mess." I mean, it's a it's a real it's a real mess. He says, I can't keep a job. My, my relationship with my wife is horrible. He says, my relationship with my kids are horrible. He, he, he says, I got all these physical problems, you know, going on. I mean, he's 35, has these little carpool tunnel things on his wrists and everything. And we're going like, oh, man. But he concludes it by saying this, and it's all my mother's fault. Really? So how's that your mother's fault? And man, he then he just lets off, lets into his mom. Oh, you know, she's into my business. She's into my family. She's my relationship with my wife, my kids, blah, 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 blah. I mean, he's just bashing his mom. So I said, okay, well, would you like to forgive your mother? No, I don't want to forgive my mom. And then he bashes her some more. So I go through all of these different reasons why he should, but it's nothing's working. I mean, it's not working at all. So I'm going, oh, great. All right, all right. So, Lord, you're going to have to give me some more strategy here. And uh, so I just I had this thought came to my head. I said, so what, what's your mom doing now? She goes, well, she's home probably. I guess she's home. So what's she doing? I don't know, watching TV. So your mom's home watching TV? Yeah, probably. I said, okay, is, is, she, is she healthy? Oh, yeah, she's, she's, she's fine. Uh, is she happy? Oh, yeah, yeah, she's, she's fine. Is she really bothered that you're upset with, with, with her? He goes, oh, oh, she can care less. I said, okay, so uh, let me get this picture right. So right now your mom is at home, happy, healthy, not bothered by you as she's watching TV, right? He goes, yeah, that's right. I said, man, this sounds like you're really getting even with her. Man, are you punishing her? I mean, you're really hurting her. I mean, she's feeling it as she's home, happy, healthy, unbothered by you as she's watching TV. <laughs> and all of a sudden, it began to, he began to realize, I'm not punishing her, I'm, I'm actually punishing me. Because he had embraced a lie. If I hang on to it, I'm hurting her. If I'm hanging on to it, I'm getting even with her. If I'm hanging on to it, I'm getting my revenge against her. Bitterness is nothing more than just unfulfilled revenge. And revenge is never your job. That happens to be God's job. Got a verse for you. It's found in the book 
of Romans chapter 12 and verse 19, and it says this. It says, Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. It's never your job. It's God's job. So I need a couple of volunteers. Trina, would you come on up here? And what is your name? Christina. Christina and Trina, would you come up here, please? So, Christina, come over here. Would you face Trina? Trina, would you face Christina? Trina, Christina. Those are <laughs> a little bit too close here. Okay, so, so let's say that let's 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 say that Christina offended Trina. So you're going to be on that one there. So now Trina, she's really upset and she's really bothered. So she, she has decided to hang on to the offense so that she can get her own revenge, okay? And let's say that, let's say I'm God because it's my illustration. I get to be who I want. No, you keep, you keep facing that way. Now, what is happening is that God would like to deal with Christina for what she has done, but here's a problem Somebody decided to stay attached to her, in which they mean when they stay attached to her, they, that means they decided to take their own revenge, which means God can't do anything before, because if God's going to deal with Christina, he has to go through Trina to, to, for that to happen. So, so therefore, God said, well, I'm not going to do that, you know. So therefore, I'd like to get to Christina, but somebody's preventing me from doing that because somebody decided to do my job. Somebody decided to be God, play God, do God's job in my, in my behalf. So therefore, guess who is being protected? So your offender is actually, if you don't release them, you're actually giving protection to your offender from God who would like to do something with them because you have decided to play God. And you decided to do God's job. I'll just be honest with you. God is really good about doing his job, and you stink at doing God's job. Her response to give God a, a clear shot is to forgive, release, and step aside. All right. So now God has a direct shot. Now understand, you can step back here, that you have, you, you have a way that you would like God to do his job. Probably you would like for Christina to suffer a little bit because you think if she suffered, then maybe you might, you might feel a little bit better. But you understand that whenever you let God into the situation, you know, that Christina has a destiny on her life and God's going to deal with her according to her destiny, not the way that you want him to deal with her. But he will shift things in Christina because you actually brought God into the situation. That word there, that passage in Romans 12, 19 is actually taken from Deuteronomy chapter 32. He's quoting from Deuteronomy 32. And in there, where it says, God says, I will repay. That word in the Hebrew is the word shalim. The root word for shalim is shalam which is also the same root word for shalom. Those are all in the same work group. So you bring God into the situation. God says, I will repay. God will give Christina what she needs for her destiny. But you remember we said that it creates an obligation. Forgive us of our debts. So we forgive our debts. In other words, when if I sin, I create an obligation. So now I have a de deficit. I have a debt that's unpaid. But God says, I will repay. Guess who comes into your, your life and compensates you for all loss? The God who says, I will pay. So now Trina gets, she gets compensated for all of her losses because she brought God into the situation and let God do his job. So you, you actually don't have any losses. You actually have all compensation because the God who says, I will repay, I'll give you both what you need. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So, and don't do that again, Christina. So. <laughs> <laughs> so.
Some people say, well, I can't forgive. But in reality, if you've received Jesus, you can because you get, you've, freely you have received. He gives you grace. You're not on your own to do this. You just make the decision and he comes through. You can actually, you can actually do this. Uh, I have I have a book on on forgiveness. I I wrote this book for three reasons. Uh, first of all, I wrote it because I wanted to lessen my counseling load. Wrote it in the nineties originally, and what I did, I said, I, 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 I'm, before somebody can actually make a counseling appointment with me. They had to read the book, and then they can make the appointment. Because ninety percent of what we're going to deal with is we're almost every ninety percent of all those counseling situations, we're going to have to deal with the forgiveness issue somewhere in that conversation. Isn't that right? <laughs> so some people read it, took care of business. They didn't need to make an appointment. Other people saw what we're going to talk about, did not want to talk about it, and they didn't make an appointment either. Either way, my counseling load really did drop. The second reason I wrote it is because I recognize sometimes people have to work it through. They have to wrestle it through. Even though God gives the grace and even though it is a simple act that we should and we could do, some people still had to work it through. I was in Redding, California one time, uh, Bill Johnson and, and Randy Clark doing this healing conference that they had. I wasn't teaching. It was at the, uh, you know, at, at, at the... Uh, uh, the convention center there, but I just was walking through when a lady comes, makes a beeline, reaches out and grabs me, and she goes, "Hey, I got to give you a story about your forgiveness book. I work in the downtown mission here in Reading, and I buy your book by the case. And I got to tell you about one family. She said, "There's this one guy who's read your book through eight times, and every time he's read it through, he's been physically healed of something else. Every time." She said, "But the greatest miracle wasn't him; it was his mom. She's living in Colorado. She's dying of cancer." I mean, she's right at, right at the end. She's an unbeliever. She's angry at God, angry at people, angry at everybody else. His sister took the book, walked her through that book three times. And in those three times, she forgave herself, forgave others, even forgave God, and then gave her life to Jesus. And she said with, within a week, she's face-to-face with him. She said that woman's in heaven because she was able to wrestle it through. I had a friend of mine who's in New Mexico, <clears throat> a missionary now or, or was it, you know, in Cambodia. He said he tells tells me the story of a doctor, medical doctor, whose parents were medical doctors and and a nurse and they were killed by the Khmer Rouge in the Kim, in the killing fields and was actually there when his father was killed saw them kill him drop into the ditch and knows exactly where they were where his father is covered over and buried with all these other people because they killed everybody who had any kind of an education angry bitter an orphan vowed to be a doctor made it over through all of those odds but he's still so full of anger and bitterness the little missionary gal walked him through my book a few times. Went to the very same place where they had saw them kill his father. Forgave the people who did that. Sometimes people have to wrestle it through. <clears throat> so that was the second reason I wrote it. The third reason I wrote it is this: is because a lot of times people they just they forgive and then they stop there and they forgiveness and all the stuff I was reading they stop there with forgiveness. But sometimes people have feelings of unforgiveness after they made the decision to forgive. So I choose to forgive, and then two weeks later, all of a sudden, I got feelings of unforgiveness rising back up. So what do I do? Well, I, I forgive them again. I thought I forgave them the first time. I must not have done that because I got these feelings of unforgiveness. Two weeks later, I forgive them again. Then I forgive them again, over and over again. Like, how many times do you got to do that? I mean, what's the secret number? Like 70 times 7? <clears throat> so you see what happens you know we talked about this earlier that if I have a, a core belief system that produces my thinking and whatever I think produces how I feel so what happens I have a core thinking system that's in agreement with bitterness usually because I've believed or embraced a lie and I have a core belief system that's in agreement with bitterness so that's going to produce feelings of forgiveness so I need to tear down bitterness and replace it 
Because you don't, you have to replace things. And I replace it with compassion. See, not thinking about it doesn't help you. I mean, if I say don't think about the number four, you th you're thinking about the number four. But if I say, well, let's take that four, multiply it by two, and then if we add three onto that, so now you're not thinking about four anymore. You've actually replaced that with the number 11 because you went through the thinking process of doing that. So we have to tear down a thinking process that's in agreement with bitterness because that's producing the feelings of bitterness. But if I got a thinking system that's in agreement with compassion, which he empowers us to do that, then when compassion rules, no matter what that person does or if I see that person or, or somebody else does something similar to that, I'm not, that doesn't push a button on me because I now am ruled by compassion. So the third reason I wrote it is so that you can tear down a stronghold of bitterness and replace it with compassion. So that's about the last third of the book. And I actually do a lot of the homework for you. So you don't have to do it. Well, you still have to do the homework, but it's, it's not as involved as you do with the other book with tearing down in the godly stronghold. So that's why I did it. Third, three reasons. So, we're all going to do it together. We're all going to forgive somebody. Now, you, you, may give, you may keep short accounts, and if you do, that's fine, but you're going to stand up and do it with us anyway. <laughs> we forgive one person at a time. right? You guys go ahead and stand up. We're going to forgive one. You always forgive one person at a time unless it's a group that did offend you, you know. Then you can forgive them as a group. But usually it's going to be, you know, rather than saying forgive everybody who hurt me. Now let's get specific about that. And that actually releases that person and that, those individuals or that maybe that particular little group when you get specific about that. So we'll cover one. And if you got more, then you and God can set a time on another day and take care of the rest. So think of who it is and then repeat after me. Say, in the name of Jesus, I choose to forgive as I have been forgiven. I now choose to forgive my offender. I release any right that I've retained to bring, revenge. to bring revenge. I release them from my hands, from my hands. And, place and place them into your hands. Jesus, my just judge. Jesus, my just judge. I, break I break every curse that I've sent to them and call forth a blessing towards them. them. Thank you, Jesus, for giving me the grace to forgive, to forgive as, I've as I've been forgiven. Okay, you can be seated. <clears throat> Let's cover one more area. Is, was there going to be an announcement you were going to try to make when this thing was over? Okay, because this is the time to say it, just in case it doesn't, we don't, make it for some people don't make it through real quick so uh rodney is going to be teaching at our church service tomorrow night and i think we're going to do some more of this so i would just encourage you guys come on back tomorrow night uh church starts at 5 30 and I, I would just encourage you just after this service after uh, we're done today stay in the place of healing like, keep your ears open. I think the Lord's going to keep moving after we're done. I think he'll keep moving tomorrow. I think you're kind of just starting, you're catalytic for more, um, more freedom to come. So just stay open, see what happens. I wanted to stand up something real quick. I just thought it'd be, since we might not get to this point, um, I know there's several people that are from other churches, and not even saying that you're here representing your church, uh, that you're maybe in ministry or not, but I just would love to, if you'd raise your hand, if this is not your home church or from another church, raise your hand. And would you mind just really quickly just to say your church out loud? Agape and Apostolic and Bryant? Summit Church? Say it again. First Baptist Benton? Awesome. 
Center Point and Bryant? Minnesota, yes. All right. Anybody? New life in Wakan, Iowa. Well, Iowa. New life in Iowa. Anybody else? Yeah. New life, GLR. New life, GLR. Awesome. Did I miss anybody else? Thank you, Jesus. Amen. So good. Thanks for coming. Yeah, for those of you who are not a part of, of this fellowship here and this, you want to train people, there is, there is that one flash drive uh, that has videos. It's eight and a half. I filmed it when I was in England uh, in 2018. Uh, it has this particular teaching that we did. Uh, it also has love bonds, fear bonds that we're going to cover tomorrow night. And, and uh, it, plus, it also has my teaching on the follow-up stuff, too. So it's eight and a half hours for that. There's a, there's a kind of a leader's help on there. And then there was teaching notes as well that you can actually make copies of and send to people. So that is, that is the, the eight and a half hour one uh, video out there called Liberated. So it's like the same name as the book. The other one is just the flash drive. It's just the you know, the audio of like this kinds of teaching. So we're going through a lot of this right now. So you don't really need that unless you know somebody who could use that. Okay. we got one more area we're going to cover. This one's kind of personal to me because the enemy whacked me with this one. I told you that I got set free, you know, that one time. That wasn't the only time I got set free. <laughs> I had a few other Klingons that I had to get rid of. <laughs> God had created the generations to be an avenue of blessing. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He also created the generations that we can walk in multiple generational anointings, not single generational anointings. God anointed Aaron as, as the high priest. So they, when they anointed him, he come, the oil flows down off his head, off of his beard, flows into this robe, and now the robe can't, contains the fragrance of Aaron's anointing. When, Agri, when, when he passes, then, then it goes into his son Eliezer, and Eliezer then becomes the high priest. And when he's anointed, even though he was anointed as a priest, he had a different robe. Now he's got the high priestly robe on. And so when he's anointed, it flows down off his head, off his beard, and into the robe. Now the robe contains the fragrance of Eliezer's anointing, and it also contains the fragrance of his father's anointing. Phineas becomes the next high priest, and guess what? Same robe. Flows off his head, flows off his beard. Now Phineas has the fragrance of his anointing on this robe, but it has his father's and his grandfather's anointing on it as well. God has not designed us to live from a single generational anointing, but multiple generational anointings. There's a highway of blessing that flows from generation to generation to generation so that we can live in a place of increase. But guess who also understands there's a highway? It wants to fill that highway with debris so that we can't walk in the blessings of previous generations. He creates offenses and all these things and really tries to, you know, and somebody gets disabled in their life. And so because of that, we don't think, we have anything good to come from our generation. And not only that, but he takes the word of God and he just basically usurps it for his own purposes. Like Numbers 14 18, the Lord is slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and the fourth generations. My grandfather was named Joe Howard. Joe was a, he was a believer. Actually, he was a very strong believer. He actually believed in all the gifts and the power of God. I mean, this, they walked in that, but he did have a struggle. He struggled with rage. Everything else he seemed to be walking okay with, but he struggled with rage. Losing his temper and his anger, and it's it just like he just had this his whole life. We don't know where he got it from, but, you know, did he get it from his, his dad? Well, he doesn't know because he never knew his dad because when he was one years old, his father was, my great-grandfather was murdered. 
butcher knife right down the middle of his head in an altercation with somebody. There might have been anger or rage in that one. We don't know. My Uncle Joe, Joe Jr., Joe Howard Jr., also had rage. They blamed that on him having a, been in an automobile accident when he was young, but he'd just go into these fits of rage. His got so bad they put him in an institution because of it. His got so bad that, that they had to, had to work out a system to calm him down. Usually my grandma was talking, talking him down, and, and, and then it got to a place where she could no longer talk him down, and so they just worked out a plan. What, my mom would take the, my other two smaller uncles, and they would, she'd go out into the field so they wouldn't be hurt. My aunt would go out into the field, get my grandpa. He'd come in. He would talk him down. That worked for a while. And then it got to a place that the only way he could calm that rage down was to hit him so hard as to knock him out. And that's when they committed him to a mental institution, which was not a good place to be in the 1930s in this nation. But the good news for Uncle Joe, he had a couple of aunts, great aunts in their 90s that knew how to reach into heaven and get God to do whatever they wanted him to do. They prayed that boy and God, he got set free when he was in that institution. He wrote my grandparents and said, come get me, God's healed me. They go, no, I don't believe that. But when my, those praying aunts wrote him a letter and says, God has spoken to us, go get, go get Joe because God has healed him. Then they got him and he was healed. The rage was gone. Uh, my, my name, my first name is Rodney, last name is Hogue, but my middle name is Howard. So I got the family name and I seem to have gotten the family demon too. I was born with rage. My dad was a pastor. I didn't get rage from him or for what, you know, I had a great home, but I had rage. I, I, I got more spankings than all of my siblings put together. I mean, we had a kindergarten in our church at First Baptist Church in, in Post, Texas, and, and, and my kindergarten teacher told my mom, I have, because we got the spank back then, she said, I have wore out more fly swatters on Rodney than I have on any other kid I've ever had. I got more spankings in my family and got more spankings in public school than all my siblings. I don't think I ever got one. I got a lot. My last one was 11th grade. I learned to utilize rage in athletics, and I excelled. Football paid my way through college. But I will have to tell you this, that having rage and pastoring a church do not go well together. (laughs) I never vented against my wife. There was one time that I came close and that's the time that I had to realize that I, this is not my friend. Because, you see, this was the hard one for me to get, get rid of because it had become my friend. When you have rage, you get to control your world. You get to control other people. When you have rage, people step on eggshells around you. So you kind of know that. So in a sense, it had been my friend. So I struggled for months knowing I had rage, but I could not get set free because it was my friend. And I had nobody to walk me through it. And I had to get to the place where it's no longer my friend. It's like it came up almost vented against my wife, almost vented against me in self-destruction. That's when the light bulb turned on. I go, this is not my friend. We're taking care of this today. And I went out and got in my little car And I just got in the parking lot, you know, at our church. And I said, I'm not leaving this car until you are gone. And me and the Holy Spirit took care of it. And it took a little bit. But it had come down my family line. It was a familiar spirit. It's not right. It's wrong. Actually, illegal. I mean, you know, Ezekiel chapter 18 just talks about it's just not right for one generation to suffer because of the next. But we don't play with, you know, we don't have an adversary that plays fair. And if he can find a loophole, he's going to go for that. 
So we'll find these things, you know, sometimes for fourth generation, sometimes up to the tenth generation, but yet the good news is, is that the, 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 the blessings of God go for a thousand generations. Psalms 108, 105, verse 8. Now, the question is, how long does God honor an agreement and a covenant that he didn't keep? I'm going to start off by re- looking at, in Isaiah chapter 28 in the New Century Version. Isaiah 28 is talking about the coming Messiah. And it says this, so listen to the Lord's message, you who brag, leaders in Jerusalem. You say, we have an agreement with death. We have a contract with death. When terrible punishment comes or passes by, it won't hurt us. Our lies will keep us safe and our tricks will hide us. And that's what this saying here, because there's an agreement, because there's a covenant, because there's a contract that has been made, it's actually protecting the darkness from getting what is due to them. Now, so the question, how long does God honor a covenant or a contract that he did not make? Well, to, go, to, to find that answer, we can just go back to the book of Joshua, chapter 9, when the Gibeonites come. You remember the Gibeonites? So the Gibeonites were these guys who were in the land. They were told not to make a covenant with them. They're part of the, the ites that they're not supposed to be making a covenant with. And, and, the, what, and they decided <clears throat> that, that they would deceive Joshua. So they found the oldest clothes that they could find, the most hardest, stalest bread that they could find. They go to Joshua. Joshua, we'd like to make a covenant with you. He says, you don't live in the land, do you? Oh, no. No, we're a long ways away. These clothes, they were brand new when we started our journey. This bread, it was fresh out of the oven. He didn't inquire of God, made a covenant with them, and then found out they lived in the land. It was against God's will, but they made a covenant, and God honored a covenant that he didn't make and that was not even in his will. The next chapter, Joshua chapter 10, they go to war with the five kings who come against the Gibeonites because they made a covenant, and they call on the people of God to to fight with them, and they had to because there was a covenant. They honored that, and they go to battle, defeat the five kings. That was the day that the sun stood still so that they could actually finish. And then they got the spoils of war. Fast forward to when David is king, 2 Samuel 21. They had gone through a three-year drought. People are dying. David inquires of the Lord, why are we in this drought like this? And the Lord gives the word and says, you're in this because your predecessor, King Saul, violated the covenants with the Gibeonites. How many generations of Gibeonites? I mean, excuse me, of, 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 I mean, between Joshua and Saul, about 450 years of generations, God honored a covenant that wasn't his. So David goes to the Gibeonites and say, how can we make this right? They said, give us seven of the descendants of Saul who they would kill. And it says that David, uh, David gave them the seven descendants, but it says that he would not give them Mephibosheth. Guys know who Mephibosheth is. Mephibosheth is the son of Jonathan. Guess who had a covenant with Jonathan? David had a covenant with Jonathan. David, I mean, I'm I'm protecting your descendants. You're protecting my descendants. Mephibosheth is is basically, he is now protected under David's covenant with Jonathan. So what happens, that there came a latter covenant, a greater covenant that nullified, obliterated, did away with any previous covenants that were made. Therefore, Mephibosheth was not bound to a covenant that Joshua made because a better covenant is now in intact David's covenant with Jonathan and now he's living under the protection of that greater covenant are you getting the connection here like 
Who do, who do we have a covenant with? Who do we have a blood covenant with? Jesus. It's a greater covenant, a better covenant, as Hebrew says. It obliterates, nullifies, cancels, crucifies any previous covenants that were made in our behalf. So to continue to reading in that messianic passage in Isaiah chapter 28, it goes on to say, because of these things, this is what the Lord God says. He says, I will put a stone in the ground in Jerusalem, a tested stone. Everything is going to be built on this important and precious cornerstone. So who's he talking about? Jesus. That's right. Anyone who trusts in it will never be disappointed. And then look what happens. He said, I'm going to use justice as a measuring line, goodness as a standard. The lies you hide behind, they're going to be destroyed as if by hail. They're going to be washed away as if in a flood. Your agreement with death, it's going to be erased. Your contract with death will not help you. And when terrible punishment comes, you will be crushed by it. That's, that's the good news. So in other words, I have the right now, because of my relationship with Jesus, I can go and ask God to go into my history, my ancestry, and I want you to examine every covenant, every contract that's been made in my behalf, either by intentionally or even unintentionally. They didn't even know they were doing that, but it's been made and the enemy is using that. It's hiding the, 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 the demonic, giving protection to the demonic. So I got, I want you to look up my ancestry line and see if everything in there is not absolutely righteous and just. And if it's not, I want you to cancel it, obliterate it, crush it, take it out completely. But if it's a godly, heavenly covenant, that one is staying intact. Everything up my family line that is my inheritance, I want it, all the good stuff. You see, a lot of things in our Christian life come automatically when we give our life to Jesus. You know, I, I come into his family. I'm a new person, new creature. My sins are forgiven. I go to heaven when I die. But there's also a lot of things we have to run after and begin to attain that also belong to us. You got promises, prophetic words. Well, you have to cooperate with those words, right? You got to pull those things. Some things you got to pray into those until they kind of manifest in your life. And when it comes to generational curses and stuff like that, sometimes with these, we have to simply just begin to enforce the law. We have to enforce what Christ has done. He, we have to enforce what he bought and paid for. And tell the squatter to leave that this isn't, this isn't your house. You see, an inheritance is something that we don't earn, we just receive. Somebody else bought and paid for it. So what we're going to do, we're going to do something very, very repetitive. Is that we're going to start off with the fourth generation, because that's the one that started off in the Word, and we're going to break off all of the curses from the fourth generation and then call on ourselves the blessings of the fourth generation. Then we're going to move to the third, then to the grandparents, and then to our parents, and then to our, our descendants. Break that off of them. As we do this, I want you to pay attention if you feel something in a particular generation. Because it may be something specifically you might need to investigate to break off specifically. Okay? People of your family line might have been just kind of... I mean, they, you go, there's no righteousness in them. Okay. They still had an inheritance that they didn't claim. You can still claim it. Even though they didn't, you can, it, it can bypass them because it's up your family line. It's your inheritance. Already bought and paid for by, by them. So let's stand. We ready to do this one? Some of you, let me just tell you that some of you will feel lighter through this. Some of you won't. Some of you actually feel heavier because of things of, that are coming down on you.
that are up your family line. So let's just repeat after me. Say, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus I declare the blood of Jesus, I the blood of Jesus to stand between me, between me and, the and the fourth generation as a wall of separation. As a wall of separation. I, cancel I cancel every assignment of darkness. I remove every right of the demonic, right of the demonic to, afflict to afflict me because of the sin of the fourth generation. And I called me my righteous inheritance and the blessings of the fourth generation. Okay, that was our great great grandparents. So let's go with our great grandparents, which is the third. Say, in the name of Jesus, I declare the blood of Jesus to stand between me and the third generation. As a, As a wall of separation. I cancel every assignment of darkness. I, every of darkness. I, remove, every right of I remove every right of the demonic. To afflict me. To afflict me. Because of the sin of the third generation. Of the sin of the third generation. And I call to me. Call to me. My, righteous My righteous inheritance. And the blessings of the third generation. Let's do our grandparents. Which is the second. Say, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus I, declare the blood of Jesus I declare the blood of Jesus to stand between me, stand between me and my grandparents, and my grandparents as, a as a wall of separation. I cancel every assignment of darkness. I remove every right of the demonic to afflict me because of my grandparents' sin. And I call to me my righteous inheritance, my inheritance and the blessings of my grandparents. And, of my grandparents. and let me just say this. When there is an adoption that takes place, the negative part, you get the cursing from both generations, from the, the natural and the adoptive parents. But the good news is you also get as you cancel that, the negative, you get the blessings of both the righteous, of, being, of, of the adoptive and the natural. So adoptive people get double portion. Just letting you know. All right. We did our grandparents. Let's do our parents. Say, in the name of Jesus, name of Jesus. I declare the blood of Jesus to stand between me and my parents. As a wall of separation, I cancel every assignment of darkness. I remove every right of the demonic to afflict me because of my parents' sin. And I call to me my righteous inheritance and the blessings of my parents. One more. In the name of Jesus. I declare the blood of Jesus to stand between me and my children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, and all my descendants as a wall of separation. I cancel every assignment of darkness. I remove every right of the demonic to afflict my descendants because of my sin. And I give my descendants my righteous inheritance and blessings. Yeah. Now just put your hands out. Just close your eyes and receive. The highway has been cleared of debris. And there are storehouses in the heavens that have your family names on them of an inheritances that were not claimed. And angels are ascending and descending with what belongs to you. You don't earn it. You receive it. 
the people of Israel, they went into the land of promise. They had cities they didn't build, wells that they did not dig, vineyards that they did not plant. All because, only because they were descendants of Abraham. Just receive. You have people up your family line who bought and paid for things. Some of them bought and paid for them with, your, with their lives even. It's been bought and paid for and it's your inheritance. So just receive. Just receive. Just receive. The angels are coming. They're going. They're coming. They're going. They're going to different houses with different names up your family line. Somebody, one of you had somebody in your family line, a little old lady meeting in a hut, having an encounter with God hundreds of years ago. And he speaks to her and says, your descendants shall. And, he, she, and, and he's talking about you. You're the one. And so she declared those over you. You're the one. There's giftings and there's anointings. Some of you have prophets. Some of you have seers. Some of you have evangelists. Some of you can actually feel it, even parts of your body. Maybe your hands are getting hot or your ears or your nose. Just pay attention. Or your feet are getting hot. There's, those are evangelist gifts there. Just pay attention. There are certain mantles that were on some of your people up your family line. And so you may even feel the weight of that. Last week we had one lady there. I mean, she was feeling her hands got lower and lower and lower as we just went on. I said, who's up your family line? She goes, J.C. Penny. I'm telling you, you got some business people up your family line. There's some entrepreneurs. There's creative people. There's people who did things. You had, there's some up your family lines that were rulers, people who oversaw cities. People who had authority over cities. And so that is up your family line. It's been stopped up, and God wants to begin to release that now. Just let it come. Increase it, Lord. Listen, we spend our time breaking things off, cutting things loose for this very moment that you can receive from heaven. And if you can see it up your family line, it's yours. Some of you are going to wake up and just prophesying in the next few days. You're like, where did that come from? Because it's an impartation from your, dan your family line. There's some apostles up your family line. There's, some, there's all these different giftings. And now it is yours. It is your inheritance. So just receive. You don't pray. You don't do anything. You just receive. Over the next, even the next few days, you're just write down journal. That means like, what do you, because some of you are going to walk away. You're like, what in the world just happened to me? Because he's taking some things off, clearing the debris. Opening up the blessing. God never intended for you to live from a single generational anointing. The world cannot be won on a single generational anointing. We have to pull from the thousand generations. That's what Psalm 105, 8. We have to pull from all of that. And that's a lot of generations. He's just making a point. It's yours. Just receive. Just receive. Just receive. Just receive. I just there's I can that's like I just feel these waves, you know, like right now I just feel another wave just coming. Just angels just making another run. Just dropping these things into your hands, on your heads, over your, over your shoulders, into your heart. Just let it come. Increase, 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 increase. 
You know, Valerie said, she said, you know, don't, don't rush this thing. Just kind of hang here with the, with the Lord. And now some of you said, well, I got, I've got things I, I've committed to do. You know, whenever you feel one to leave, you, I mean, you're released to go. But right now there's, there's something going on here. So if you want to hang in here, hang in here and just let it come. Just let it come. Just let it come. Just receive more, more, Lord. Some of you have family members that involved in the revivals, the movements of God. They were part of those moves. They saw heaven open up. I just walk in their blessing. It's yours. Increase it. Increase it, Lord. Just more of you. It's your inheritance. He's just... I just break off anything that says I'm not worthy. All that unworthy stuff, we break that off. I, Listen, this, not, this is not something that comes for worthiness. This comes because of inheritance. You were born into a line that has things flowing from it. And your only posture is to receive it and be a faithful steward what gets deposited into your hands. Increase it. Just the more. Just the more. Some of you feel just the, the heaviness. Of the mantle that was on somebody in your line. Elisha walked into with the mantle of Elijah. He asked for double and he got it. Because he called out Elijah as his father, and there was an inheritance, and he got it. Just receive. Maybe if you can put on maybe some light receiving music or something like that. Just stay here. Just stay in this posture. If you need to go, you know, feel free to go. We're not going to pray for anybody. This, uh, it's not the time to do that. It's the time for you to sit here and to receive what God wants to put on you. That's the only invitation now. And when the Lord gives you the peace to say, hey, we're done, then, hey, listen, don't feel obligated to stay just because other people are, are staying. But understand this, this will not stop when you walk out of this building. I mean, don't be surprised, even in the middle of the night, some of the dreams you have, what you wake up in the middle of the night thinking or feeling. 
and ask him at times. Just say, Lord, what, what, was, what is that? And let him just begin to speak to your spirit. Some of you today had quite a few things broken off with, with the power of those words and maybe even forgiving, maybe even cutting off a soul tie. But we definitely cut loose anything off that generational line. And like I said, that was personal for me because I came into freedom when I got set free of a generational thing. Rage no longer is there. It was immediately gone. And when I learned how to live in blessing, I learned to live in what, what my dad carried. The day that he passed, or a few hours before he passed, I felt the weight of his calling on me. He was in Texas, I was in California. I didn't even know what this was, but it was the weight of his calling on him. This is the guy who's good friends with Billy Graham. I mean, Billy wrote the the forward to my dad's first book and he did a schools of evangelism this he's a world changer and i remember the day my dad laid hands on me and he, he says you know i'm not all the promises that god has given me or have been fulfilled and that's what bothered me the most about going on to be with him but my promises are still good neither i either i will fulfill them or you will fulfill them but they will come to pass he laid his hands on me, and I didn't feel that effect of that for about three weeks before he passed, and the weight of it came. Some of you had people stolen out of your life who died before it was their time. With some people, it's the time to die. Some people, it's not the time they're taken before it's time. And that grave, or that, that, that gift is crying from the grave because you've let it lie. Now it's time to pull it in sevenfold because when it's been stolen, I think you can claim things sevenfold. That's found in Proverbs. Job, it was twofold, but in Proverbs, it's sevenfold. Lord, bring that back. Bring that provision, that gift that was stolen, that which was taken from our family, that which was taken from our church. Lord, seven. Restore that, restore that, restore that. Sevenfold. Listen, if the enemy is stolen from you, it's time to go back into the courts of heaven and take back, claim back what he's ripped you off of. And if it's from your family, I just demand generational restoration. I demand compensation. plus punitive damages. <laughs> Just receive. Just receive. So this is how we're just ending it today. Whenever you just, you feel like, ah, okay, we're, we're good. Then, hey, you're good. But otherwise, hang, just hang in here and let the Lord pour on you in you and around you. What's up your family line? The things that are inheritance. <laughs> <laughs>